morning. Welcome to Golden Harvest. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh, we are going to begin by reading a few verses from Psalm 95. Psalmist says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is also his. The sea is his, and he made it, in his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship, and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. <clears throat> we're glad that you're here with us this morning, and we're looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in our midst. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll call on our song leader. All right? Father, we thank you for this day and for your blessings to us. We thank you, Father, that you are the maker of all, that you are God above all gods, that you are the Lord, and that you are our Savior. And Father, I pray as we gather this morning that you may indeed meet with us, that you may accept our worship, that you may be well pleased with it, and that, Father, that you may work in our hearts. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll stand with me, I'm your song leader. <laughs> We're going to sing a chorus. Uh, since I've been here, we haven't sung this, so it may be new to some of you, but it's not a new chorus, let me assure you. He knows my name. <clears throat>
a slow start. So let's try that song one more time, all right? So we'll jump right into the Randall. Uh, our young people were at the Heritage Baptist Church in Barrie uh, from Thursday afternoon through yesterday at noon. And uh, they had a great time, and we are excited uh, that they were able to have that trip. So we've got just a few pictures for you. Uh, that is Pastor Brett Pennell. Uh, he is the host pastor uh, of Heritage and uh, the young people snapped a uh, picture of him. This is Pastor Al Stone in his Captain Canada uh, character with a bunch of our young people that went. And there's the whole gang. And uh, we are grateful for those who were able to take them. Now you can't see this picture really well, but if you could see the original picture, in the front row, in the middle section, are all of our teenagers. Right up front, right in the thick of it, and uh, when I, I saw the picture, and then I, I, my wife pointed it out to me that our young people are the ones right on the front row. So we praise the Lord for what the Lord did. Uh, and I'm not gonna, I think there's one more picture, Randall. Uh, Pastor Al Stone and uh, Evangelist Scott Pauley were the speakers, and uh, I think the Lord did something special in our young people's lives. I want to ask Richard, our youth director, if he would come and just say a few words. Well, first of all, the weekend was an absolute success. Um, we want to thank you all for all the prayers and for being able to send your kids up for the weekend with us. Um, we did have uh, two young men this weekend commit their lives to Christ, and we had another one who decided that he wanted to know more and be more involved. Um, the kids, they all wanted the front row. That's why they ended up getting the front row. We had, it was, it was mostly the boys that ended up rushing to the front row and getting all the girls to go up there with them. So, that they got drug along. Um, a couple of them really wanted signatures from Captain Canada. So they, they all had a good time. On the way back, they were all talking about about all the all the messages that they had heard and the pastors that they had heard from. All of them really liked Pastor Al Stone and Pastor Scott Pauley. Um, but it was really encouraging to see those those three young men who had made made commitments and the, the main theme for the conference this year was from Proverbs 16.9. Um, a man's heart uh, plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And we were able to see those young men take their next step towards Christ. Amen. Amen. And I believe a couple of them uh, actually surrendered their life to whatever God wants for them to do. Correct? So we praise the Lord for that. All right, we're going to sing uh, a hymn that we haven't sung for quite a while, all right, if, uh, if ever, all right? So we're going we're gonna to stand and sing, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. The rookie song leader and new songs.
concerts. <laughs> I'm just so excited to be singing that I uh, forgot my other job. Uh, starting tomorrow at the uh, Double Tree Inn in uh, Niagara Falls is the Niagara Bible Conference. The Niagara Bible Conference was started in 1883. And Hudson Taylor was one of the founding people behind it. And uh, we, uh, a group of pastors, have determined that they were going to resurrect this Bible conference. So it is uh, a nominal fee of $50 for registration, and you can register at NiagaraBibleConference.com. But there's going to be preaching right through Thursday and uh, every evening as well. And so we encourage you to uh, check out the conference online and register if you'd like to attend. Our Awana Awards night is coming up this Wednesday night at 6.30. And so uh, there is no Bible study, but we still encourage you to come. All of our folks that come to the Bible study, we encourage you to come and uh, support our Awana kids as they receive their awards. Uh, we made mention uh, Wednesday night that two of our club young people are receiving the Citation Award. The Citation Award is for young people that have gone through Awana from the very beginning to the very end. And this year across Canada, there are 12 that are receiving the Citation Award, and two of them are from Golden Harvest. And so we praise the Lord for that accomplishment. So come 6.30 Wednesday night and uh, support our young people. Uh, next Saturday evening at 6 o'clock here at the church, we're going to be showing the movie Show Me the Father. And uh, I cannot stress enough how important this movie is for our men, for our ladies, for our young people. Uh, it is a true, uh, truly gripping uh, examination of fatherhood. And so we encourage you to come. Plan on being with us. You don't have to worry about eating before you come. We'll have pizza here. And uh, we're just going to have a great time together. Uh, Secret Sisters, you if you have signed up, please make sure you look up Judy Cudney in the hallway as you leave today, and you will receive your designated Secret Sister. Uh, ladies, your spring event is coming up May the 14th at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. It is a brunch, and it's entitled Bloom Where You're Planted. And so there's going to be a great deal of events going on that day, and we encourage you to come. Emily Featherstone, a pastor's wife from uh, Harvesters Baptist Church in London, will be our guest speaker and singer. And so we encourage you to be a part of that. If you haven't yet signed up, please make sure you do today. You want to be here and be a part of that luncheon. Overcomers is coming up Monday, May 16th at 11 o'clock, and this month it is going to be a spring barbecue and fellowship, all right? Uh, so there's really no speaker to boot, it's just food, which is a Baptist foundation, all right? We have to have food when we get together, and uh, that will be Monday, May 16th at 11 o'clock here at the church. Congratulations go out to the Weeb and Coop family on uh, the birth of Noah Isaac Coop. And I believe that was Friday morning early. And so uh, mom and baby are doing well, and we extend our congratulations to them. All right. I can't call Danny up, can I? But I can call our special music up, Barb and Bob.
We're going to look at the whole psalm this morning, and uh, I promise you we won't be here past noon. All right? Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked <clears throat> and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert, because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth. And with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also, and lift them up forever. Father, as we come to the message this morning, we confess to you that many times we come into this place and we are tired and we are empty. We are in need of a lift. We are in need of you to come alongside us and to just give us that which we need most. Father, it is our opinion many times that what we just need is encouragement. But there are times where we need to be challenged. There are times where we need to be confronted with the sin in our lives. And so I pray today, Father, that you may indeed give each of us in this moment what we need for this hour, for the week that lies before us, that we may be instruments in your hands and that you may use us effectively to minister to someone else this week. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. One pastor uh, recently made this statement. He said, I recently became aware that some folks shop for churches much as you would shop for a car or a home appliance. In talking with some people about joining our church, they said that they were shopping. That's their word, not mine. That they were shopping for a church but systematically attending each church in the neighborhood. And when they had shopped and gone around to all of them,
Then they would compare values and make a decision. He goes on to say, when I considered the fact that there are some 38 congregations, Bible congregations, who meet for worship within one mile of our church, I realized that it would be quite a while before these folks made up their minds. And so I just had to ask them, what will be the basis of your decision? After all, these 38 churches will be different in many ways. They'll have different programs, they'll be different sizes, different kinds of people in them, not to mention widely different doctrine. Is there anything in particular that you're looking for? The answer that came back time and time again was that we're looking for a church where we can get a lift every Sunday. We're looking for a church where we can get a lift. You know, I think all of us have that desire when we come to church that that the pastor is going to say something or the music is going to be such that we are able to leave having been lifted up and encouraged, having been strengthened for what lies ahead for us in the week to come. Uh, in fact, I doubt there's anyone that comes to church and says, I really hope the pastor steps on my toes today. I really would like to feel miserable when I leave church. It doesn't happen very often. We all want that little shot in the arm, that little bit of encouragement to get us through what lies before us. I understand that. I understand that sometimes you need encouragement. You need somebody to just come alongside and lift you up and, and get you back on track and get you moving in the right direction. I understand it because many times I come to church and I feel exactly the same way. And then I remember I have to preach. So I know what you're going to get. And sometimes I know that my messages aren't necessarily encouraging. Uh, I don't have the hairstyles of Joel Osteen. And I don't have the feel-good messages necessarily of Joel Osteen. But I can tell you this. That what I have for you is the word of God. What I have for you is truth from scripture that is going to give you what you need in this moment. So if you've had a rough week, a rough month, a rough year, for some of you, you've had just a plain old rough life. Right from the get-go, it seems that you have had one problem after another. One struggle beyond what you would expect or what you would ever hope for. I believe that the answer for what we need is more complicated than just saying that you need a lift. Because there are times where we don't necessarily need a lift. We need a little bit of a boot up the backside. Right? Would you agree with that? I know I do, so I'm just thinking that maybe I'm not much different than you. That periodically we need somebody to say, hey, smarten up and get back on track. But I believe that when we come to a worship service, that we can get out of it what we put into it. And you, you surely know what I'm saying because there are times where we come and we are almost comatose. Can I get an amen, Michael? Yeah. We are almost to the point where we could fall asleep before the pastor even begins to speak. Now, I've shared stories of how I've put people to sleep before. Uh, and, you know, this church has been pretty good. I, I don't have necessarily people that regularly fall asleep. Uh, but I, I pastored a church in Stony Creek years ago. And uh, I had a lady that was notorious for sleeping in church. I had one lady that one evening service, she actually laid down on the back row of chairs. And that was it. She was gone. But I had a lady that sat on the front row and she always wore this big brimmed hat. And she would always have her head down and her Bible open on her lap. And so you never really knew whether she was with you or whether she had checked out long before you even started preaching. 
Until one evening, she was sitting on the front row with her Bible open and her head down and her big old hat on, and her Bible slowly began to slide off of her lap. And I saw it when it started. And I thought, well, this should be interesting. This will tell me whether or not she is with me. And the Bible began to slide, and it slid, and it got to her knees, and it was half off, and then it fell to the floor, and then she woke up. You may be in that same position. I know some of you sit here week after week, and you look like you're praying for me, and I appreciate the thought that I have that you are lifting me up in prayer, but I know for some it is because you just have fallen asleep. You're not there. And you're not there necessarily because you need somebody to just pick you up and get you moving again. You need someone to encourage you. Someone to, to just come alongside and help you get through the day. You've had such a rough week. The writer of the 28th Psalm comes to worship one day needing a lift. He came to worship the Lord, needing someone to help him because he was going through a tough time. And we know that as we've gone through the Psalms and we've, we've looked at different Psalms, that many times the psalmist will begin a Psalm having poured, or having poured out his heart as to what's going on in his life. That his life is a mess, that there's a ton of things going wrong, that things aren't where he wants them to be. But oftentimes in those psalms, before the psalm ever ends, the psalmist has gotten his attitude back in line. He's gotten to see exactly what is going on. He recognizes that God is sovereign and that he is still on the throne, and things begin to change. And this psalm is no different. Because as we begin the psalm, the psalmist has some issues. He speaks about the thing or the feeling of being alone and unheard as he begins the psalm. Look at uh, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Under thee, O Lord, will I cry. O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me. Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. He has come to worship the Lord, and he feels all alone. Not only all alone, but he feels that God isn't listening, that God isn't there, that he, he has forgotten all about him. Now, I'm not sure if you can relate to that, if you've ever had those experiences where you feel that God is somehow drifted off and left you all by yourself. I'm pretty confident with a group this size that there's at least a few of you that have come to that place. I said just a little while ago that what you put into worship, you will get out of. We come to worship the Lord, many of us with heavy hearts. Many of us with a ton of things going on. We have people that have gotten severe diagnosis of life-altering diseases. We have people that are worried about things that are going on in their life and what's going to happen if this happens. And we come to worship services and we come needing something. And I can assure you folks that God is here with us. That he knows every care and concern of your heart. He knows what you're going through. He knows the pain that you're dealing with. But we need to come with a few things as well. The psalmist begins and he says, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord my rock, be not silent to me. As the psalmist comes to worship, the first thing he brings is his voice. He says, unto thee do I lift up my voice. I cry to you. I, I come before you and I pour out my heart before you and, and I share with you everything that's on my heart and what's going on in my life. He says, 
Lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands. So he, he brings his voice and he lifts up his voice before God, and then he brings his hands. He uses his body in worship, if you will. Now, I know some of you have grown up in very strict churches that you're not used to hands being raised. In fact, the only time you're used to raising your hand in a church service is when you're expecting somebody to come through the door and you save them a seat and you raise your hand to get their attention. And I know, I mean, personally, I, I got saved in a fundamental independent Baptist church that was uh, strict, strict, strict. I mean, you, the, you don't smoke, you don't chew, and you don't go with the girls that do. Right? It was it was very strict. In fact, I grew up so right wing that I didn't like making left turns. So I wasn't used to raising hands. <clears throat> One of the pastors up at the youth conference Thursday night, I took uh, helped transport some of the kids, and so I stayed for the Thursday evening service. And there was one church there, uh, and their pastor was just up a little bit from me. And, and uh, during one of the songs, he came back and he says, I I'm, I'm afraid they're going to kick us out of here. I said, why? He says, you see all the people with their hands in the air? Those are people from my church. <laughs> Nobody else had their hands in the air. I think it's okay to lift your hands when you're worshiping God. It's okay to focus on who he is. We don't do it. And, and sometimes people get the impression that people do that. They raise their hands so that they get attention drawn to themselves. That's not their motivation. Maybe for some, I don't know. But I think that by and large, when someone raises their hands in worship during a song, that they are lifting up their hands to God in worship because he is worthy of our worship. So for some of you, it may take a little bit of getting used to. But let me encourage you that if the Lord prompts you during a song to raise your hand, don't be afraid to raise your hand. I I got to tell you, when I'm up on the platform and, and we're singing and I'm not leading the singing uh, and I'm able to look out over the congregation, I'll see people raise their hand that don't normally do. It. And it, it blesses my heart because I know that, that they're not doing it for somebody to come alongside them and say, hey, boy, you're really spiritual. They're doing it because they are enraptured with who God is with what he is doing. And they are worshiping him by raising their hands. Then the psalmist says, in verse 2, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. The psalmist uses his voice, he uses his hands, and I believe that he uses all of his emotion. He is involved in this worship completely. He says, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my voice, when I pour out my soul before you. Let's begin this morning by understanding that one of the keys to getting a lift out of worship is to bring your whole self and to use your whole self in worship. Sometimes we sit in a church service, and I get it, I, I understand, because, I mean, I've been there. We sit in a church service, and we are thinking about all the problems we had this last week and how we're going to overcome them in the week to come, not to mention the problems that are going to come in the week ahead of us. And we're thinking through our schedule, and we're thinking about the meetings we have to go to or the appointments we have with the doctor, and we're thinking of all the things 
that are on our plate. <coughs> and the last thing we're really focusing on is the Lord. The last thing we are really ever thinking about is lifting up our soul before him. David comes to the, the tabernacle to worship God, and he doesn't come, and this is, again, as I've said before, but I'll say it again, what I love about the Psalms is that it's real. It's real. He, he doesn't put on pretenses. He doesn't try to say that, you know, using church language, you know, Christianese. He doesn't wrap all of his emotions in what he thinks others expect him to say, but instead he pours out his heart of how he really feels. Things are really bad right now. I, I'm going through a tough time, and it seems like you've abandoned me. It seems like you're silent. I don't hear from you. He pours it out. He, he just lets it be out there. He doesn't try to put on airs. He doesn't try to pretend that he's something that he's not. He feels alone. He feels unheard. <clears throat> it doesn't matter this morning, folks, if you have been used to or grown up in a church where the rafters vibrate every Sunday from the bass of the drums and the, the music. Or if you've grown up in a church where they sing three hymns and the doxology. It doesn't matter. You can worship God in any setting. Do you understand that? You can worship God in any setting. You can worship God in the singing of hymns. Because I'll tell you this. In the singing of hymns, there is a lot of doctrinal truth in the old hymns. There's a lot of truth in the old hymns. Amen. And if we would focus on the message that that writer is putting forth, Amen. I think it can really do something in our hearts. As opposed to thinking about what we'd rather have. My wife told me this week that my musical taste had changed. <clears throat> All because I had her listen to a song by Casting Crowns. But if you listen to the words and the message of any song, it can bless you, it can lift you, it can encourage you, it can minister to your heart where you are at that moment. Psalmist comes and he's pretty low when he comes to service. He's pretty low when he comes to worshiping God. But he comes and he just is honest with God and he pours out his heart and he lets God know exactly how he is. Let me challenge you today that when we are in a service and when we are singing, don't focus on the organ. Don't focus on the song leader. But focus on the words of the song that's being sung. And let God use it in your life. I know we're not going to have a bunch of people that all of a sudden, the next song we sing, they're all going to be raising their hands. But maybe it'll start with a, you know, just a little, not quite above the belt, but just a little. That's okay. You are here not to impress anyone. You are here not to make me think highly of you. You are here to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is your only focus when you come into a church service. He's the only reason you're here. Is to worship him. It's not some kind of formula. That there's no magical formula to getting a lift out of worship. You can't come to church and do A, B, and C and get B as the result. We come and we we just come before God with all of the baggage and all of the problems and all of the heartaches that we've had all week long. And we pour out our hearts before God. And he is the only one we're concerned about. A great Danish philosopher. 
and theologian Soren Kierkegaard told a parable about worship and reacting to the sterile, lifeless, bloodless worship of the churches of his native Denmark. Let me tell you, that's why I shy away from anything that can be construed as being ritualistic. Is because I don't want our services to be lifeless and dead. I don't want it to be ritual. I don't want it to be just a repeat, repeat, repeat. I want there to be something in our church services that draws our hearts to God. Kierkegaard observed that when we come to church, we expect to be the audience. And the preacher is the actor. But it ought not to, to be that way, said Kierkegaard. In worship, we are the actors. The preacher is merely the prompter. And it is God who is the audience. We don't come to church to be entertained. We don't come to church to have our ego stroke. We don't come to church to be just lifted up and fluffy and, and go out into the world and have no depth at all. We come to church to be challenged and encouraged and fed so that we can go out and live for Christ in the week ahead of us. Can we get a lift out of worship? Absolutely we can. If we will bring our whole selves. If we will look at worship as our time with God. We benefit beyond that, of course. We benefit because we have fellowship with other believers and we're able to enjoy the singing and we're, we're able to just connect with other people. But it is, in fact, your time with God in corporate worship. It will encourage you and challenge you and lift you and help you in the week to come. The second thing we find here is that he speaks about the folks that he's stuck with. He brings that concern to his worship life. Look at verses 3 through 5. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them and not build them up. Again, the psalmist is being pretty honest here. He's talking about all the turkeys that he lived with. <clears throat> all, of the, all of the people that, that play the part, but there's no depth in their life. All the people that, that come to the services, come to worship God, and they come to impress others. They come to show off their new attire. They come to, to be something seen rather than to truly worship God. And he is frustrated. I think you can see it fairly clearly in verses 3 through 5. He's frustrated with these people. They speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. These people aren't legitimate. They're not truly honest and open. They are showing off. They are being a showpiece for others to see. And it's frustrating him. You ever get that way? You ever get upset when you see somebody that you know is just putting on airs? I mean, they're not being honest. They're playing a role that they aren't living out week by week. And he speaks about these people that he's surrounded with. Let me read verses 3 and 4 to you from the Christian Standard Bible. Christian Standard Bible renders it this way. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with the evildoers who speak in friendly ways with their neighbors while malice is in their hearts. Repay them according to what they have done, according to the evil of their deeds. Repay them according to the work of their hands. Give them back what they deserve. Wow. What kind of a prayer is that for church? Right? Lord, sock it to them. Give them what they deserve. Let them have it. It's not 
your typical prayer, right? Uh, at least we wouldn't openly admit to that being our typical prayer. Maybe we pray that, but not in church necessarily. Doesn't sound very Christian. Doesn't sound like what we'd expect. Not the nicey, nice pablum that we often put up with. Part of our problem, if we do not get a lift out of worship, is that we make our worship antiseptic and unreal. We aren't honest with God. We come to church and we expect that we have to behave a certain way and act a certain way. And when somebody says, how are you today? We say, well, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. When you feel homicidal. When you feel like strangling someone. When, when life has just been difficult. And rather than be honest and say, you know what, I'm struggling right now. I could use your prayers. Everything's fine. I'm good. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, life is wonderful. Is it? That's what I love about this, is that, that he's not playing airs. He's not trying to, to fill a role and to play a part. He's just being open and honest about how he feels. We can do so much and we can come to church and we can just do what others expect us to do. Or we can come to church like many of us already are, broken and hurting and in need of healing. And we can just be honest with God. You know, I, I think I'd rather have people come to church and say, preacher, I'm a mess. I, I, I'm having trouble keeping things, the, 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 the car on the road. I, I'm just, I am a train wreck. I'd rather have people come to me and be honest with the way that they are feeling than to tell me that I'm just being great. The Lord is so good to me. And you don't really feel that way. You're struggling, you're hurting, you're upset, you're angry, you're frustrated, you are depressed, but yet we put on an air when we come to church. Third thing we see is in verses 6 through 9. And what we see in verses 6 through 9 is completely different than what we've seen in the first five verses. Verse 6, he says, Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my soul will I praise him. The Lord is their strength and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. When we come to verse 6, there is a turning point in this song. There's a different feel to it. The psalmist has poured out his heart and he's let God know exactly how he feels. And through that process, his attention has been drawn to God, who is the one who holds tomorrow, who is the one who is sovereign and providential over all things. And he has seen a little bit of a turn in his heart. There's been a little bit of a change in his attitude. Right? I have a pastor friend in Hamilton that, that has always said to his young people, that it's your attitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. Our attitude is everything. And through the course of this worship that David has involved himself in, as he's poured out his heart, as he's been open and honest and brutally honest, something has transpired in him. And his attention has been focused now on God. Off of his problems, off of his heart, it's all, off of all of the problems he's going through, and his focus now is back on God, and we can see a definite change. Verses 1 through 5 involve his issues, his problems, and his complaints. God has been silent. 
He doesn't want to be taken away with the wicked. He asks that those that have betrayed him or hurt him be dealt with in a similar fashion. He asks for those who have no regard for the works of God or who he is to get their just deserts. But now, now he begins to bless the Lord. I love verse 7. Verse 7 says, my heart trusted in him and I am helped. Let me ask you this this morning. Have you been helped? As you have trusted in God, in those moments of weakness and trial and testing and hardship, as you trusted in him and leaned on him, have you been helped? Have you found him to be faithful? I'm certain you have. Let's face it, there are times when we show up here and we desperately need God to do a work in us. We're miserable, we're self-centered, we're angry, our attitude stinks. Let me remind you, I've said it before, but let me remind you that worship is not about you. I'm sorry to be the one to break the news to you, but worship is not about you. It's about him. It's not having our needs met. It's about adoring and worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's not about what I need. But the reality is this, folks. The reality is this. And hear this. Because this is important. Though worship is not about us, and it's not, we don't wrap a whole service around what you may need in this moment in time. As we lift our hearts to him in worship, something happens inside of us. Something begins to change inside of us. And we leave from worshiping him with a changed attitude, with a changed perspective. You know what I'm going, what I'm going through right now stinks. And it's not right. And, and things aren't fair. And, and life has dealt me a rough hand. But you know what? God is still good. God is still on the throne. God still knows what I need. And God gives me what I need in that moment time and time and time again. Through the worship of God, we can get a lift. And we can leave this place different than when we came in. Can you get a lift out of worship? Yes. To be honest, you can. But it's not about a secret formula. It's not about doing this and this is going to be the result. And yes, we are surrounded sometimes by turkey. We're surrounded by people that push our buttons. You know, you know those people? They just constantly push our buttons. And when we come to church many times, we're just at an end. I don't even know if I want to be here. It's been that kind of a week. But it's in those times when we aren't sure we even want to go to church that usually we walk away thinking, am I glad I came because God has given me what I need today. We come to worship him and we are blessed as a result of it. Life is hard. Life is challenging. Life stinks by time. God is good. Amen. And the best is yet to come. Amen. For the child of God, the best is yet to come. Amen. This world, man, I tell you what, you don't have to watch the news very long before you know that this world is falling apart at the seams. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's easy for us many times to think, you know, I don't think there's anybody that is really wanting to live for God and serve God in these days. And it's easy for us, especially older people, to say, you know what? This world's a mess, and look at the young people that are coming up. I'll tell you what. You should have gone to Barry. 
to over 500 teenagers excited to be there whose lives I think have been changed because of what they experienced this past weekend. And sometimes we need that as well. We need God to just come alongside us and smarten up, get your focus back where it needs to be, do what you know you're supposed to do, look to me, worship me, and your change would come automatically. Amen. It'll come because God will begin to do a work in our hearts, begin to change us from the inside. Father, we thank you for this day and for your blessings to us, for this opportunity to gather together. And Lord, I pray that you may indeed help us to be lifted because we have come to worship you today. Lord, you are an awesome God, and we are blessed as your people. There are so many things that we have in our lives that that tend to weigh us down to the point that we often miss the subtle hand of God at work in our lives. Father, I pray that you may help us to focus everything on you, to come to worship you with our voice, with our hands, with our emotions. Help us to be honest with you and I pray that you would indeed change us. Help us to leave with a different attitude. Help us to leave with a spring in our step. With a song on our lips. And we'll give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one verse of I Need Thee Every Hour. stand together as we sing. would not just occur at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock on Sunday, but it may occur day after day after day in our individual walk with you. Bless us, strengthen us, encourage us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.